Many of our government, like, well, according to you, says do not fear, and that's fantastic. Do not fear. I don't know really anything about it other than they do supposedly like Since the start of the pandemic, QAnon has grown from being a fringe conspiracy theory in the United States to a global phenomenon with millions of followers. From London to Rome, Berlin to Melbourne, anti-mask and anti-lockdown protesters have been taken to the streets, with some claiming that the pandemic has been caused by 5G cell phone towers, and others alleging that it's entirely fake, an elaborate plot concocted by a cabal of satanic worshipping pedophiles who are attempting to erode individual liberties and exert control using vaccines. It's all about control. Look at the science. Show me the science with a mask, because I'll show you science. The virus goes right through the mask. QAnon originated in 2017, when cryptic messages began appearing on the anonymous messaging board 4chan, with a user named Q Clearance Patriot claiming to be a government mole with access to classified information. Without proof, Q claims Donald Trump is waging a war against the deep state and liberal elites, including a Satanist pedophile cabal who are harvesting the blood of children. It's a theory Trump refuses to denounce. What I do hear about it is they are very strongly against pedophilia, and I agree with that. I mean, I do agree okay. with that, and I agree but with it. But there's not a strongly. satanic uh, pedophile. I have called no idea. I know you don't about know that? that? Okay. No, I don't know you that. You just this week. do you know that. It is not known how many Americans truly believe or even understand the ins and outs of this conspiracy theory. But QAnon adherents have turned QAnon into a counter-establishment movement carried by the alt-right or like-minded conservative groups abroad. An internal investigation by Facebook uncovered thousands of groups and pages with millions of members and followers that support the QAnon conspiracy theory. Look at how it makes us look around the world. It's mortifying. It's embarrassing. And it's dangerous. It's dangerous. If the president doesn't know better, which I, he has to know better, and my lord, we're in much more trouble than I ever thought we were. QAnon has been further legitimized by 27 candidates who have promoted QAnon theories and are running for Congress in the upcoming election, including Marjorie Taylor Greene, who won her local primary and is on track to be elected Congresswoman in the state of Georgia. You've got Democrats and Republicans, and they're all, there's many of them part of the deep state. They say as many as one third. Um, of our government is involved in this. Russell Muirhead is a professor of democracy and politics at Dartmouth and recently co-authored a book entitled A Lot of People Are Saying, which explores how conspiracy theories have moved from the fringes of society to the heart of government. I remember when I was in graduate school, I lived in Boston, Massachusetts, which is the center of Red Sox nation. And I would procrastinate, which is the central activity of any good graduate student, by going to games in the afternoon. I'd always pass the same guy selling t-shirts that said, Yankees suck. Well, in those days, Yankees were the world champions. And I'd look over him and I'd say, you know, you do understand that the Yankees don't actually suck, don't you? And he, you know, he looked at me like I was a crazy person. But, you know, the proposition that the Yankees sucked was factually unsupported. You know, it was about tribal identification. And when people go to a Trump rally and hold up a Q sign, it's about affiliation. If I were to try to recast it in a way that wasn't completely barking mad, I'd say it's a way of saying I stand with Trump and I think that he's a force for good in the world. Belief in conspiracy theories is very common. Surveys have consistently shown, not only here in the US, but in other countries, that about 50% of the population believes in at least one conspiracy theory. And so that highlights that belief in conspiracy theories is really a normal process. Prior to the age of modern democracy, parties were conspiracies. Groups of people who wanted to unseat the power holders had to conspire in secret because if their machinations were visible, they would, of course, been executed for sedition. They were concerned that this phenomenon is, in fact, reverting and that we're beginning again to think of parties as conspiracies, as something that's not legitimate, as groups that, that are not merely opponents, but that are enemies. Conspiracy theories often arise during times of societal crisis where information isn't forthcoming, and so people who need closure and certainty 
will often gravitate towards conspiracy theories for those kinds of answers. Our country and our elitists are literally using the blood of children to fuel their everything. Lack of analytical thinking, lack of education, uh, and also something called bullshit receptivity has also been found to be more common in people who believe in conspiracy theories. And finally, it's something called a teleologic bias, which describes the preference for some people to want to believe that everything happens for a reason, some sort of higher purpose, rather than events just happening randomly. Levels of mistrust in government institutions, in scientific institutions, has been the lowest it's been in at least half a century. People just are very vulnerable to coming to believe information that just frankly isn't true. And in the era of the internet, of course, doing that is very easy. For a long time, the internet was a domain of computer scientists and researchers. It emerged in the 1960s. Today, the web has become an everyday part of our lives and is used for everything from grocery shopping to finding a date. Conspiracy theories are nothing new. Since World War II alone, the assassination of JFK, the moon landing, and 9-11 have attracted conspiracy theories, with people concocting stories to try and make sense of real-life events. However, QAnon represents a new form of conspiratorial thinking. Conspiracy theory has given way to conspiracy without the theory, whereas conspiracy theorists used to take a great care to assemble evidence or pseudo-evidence, to connect the dots, to find patterns. We notice that that's given way to a kind of conspiratorial allegation that sits out there all by itself, without any foundation of evidence, without any explanation. SWAT teams moved in Sunday afternoon after a man opened fire with an assault rifle inside a popular pizza restaurant in Washington, D.C. The one that caught our attention first is this narrative that goes by the name Pizzagate. According to Pizzagate, Hillary Clinton was running a child sex trafficking ring out of uh, the basement of a pizzeria in Washington, D.C. And of course, this struck us as a as, you know, kind of a preposterous narrative. It wasn't preposterous to Edgar Welch, who showed up at the pizzeria with an assault rifle that he fired in the pizzeria, hoping to free the children who were, he assumed, locked up in the basement. It did not have a basement. Of course, there were no children being held. Um, as he said, after he was imprisoned, the intel on that wasn't 100 percent. The the intel on that was zero percent. The desire to understand is a big reason why people believe in conspiracy and the desire to control. So when we face a threat that we can neither understand and therefore not control, it's it's really quite disequilibrating. I can you know, relate to that right now as we all live through this pandemic. The data analytics company Graphica has observed an explosive growth of QAnon content being shared on social media since the start of the pandemic. When we first mapped QAnon in June 2018, it was the most dense conspiracy community we had ever studied, which means that the accounts themselves were following accounts of similar interests online, and it was presenting as a very tightly connected community. We started to notice that it was becoming more autonomous, and these accounts were actually embedding themselves in different movements online and different community spaces. You can see it basically like an atom splitting, and this has then kind of metastasized into what is essentially a QAnon anti-vaccination movement or a QAnon plus anti-government conspiracy in France. So that it really relies on those movements having existed in countries before and there being active conspiracies about various parts of the government or the media or public institutions. It did have an international presence prior to um, the pandemic. Uh, QAnon had moved to Canada, France and UK through the Yellow Vest protests and had been part of those digital ecosystems they had gotten into UK through Brexit. There was an overlap between disinformation around Brexit and QAnon. In the UK, I think there has been a reliance on existing street movements, right-wing movements that are protesting immigration and the control of the media by the UK government. In Germany, it got into that ecosystem in light of the election and QAnon in Germany is closely linked to the AFD. In Germany, I think what we've seen is an aligning with a social movement and a political movement that's very anti-Merkel and focused on health misinformation.
A recent survey conducted by Hope Not Hate found that a quarter of people in Britain agree with conspiracies propagated by QAnon, with young people under 35 proving to be particularly susceptible. My journey believing in QAnon, it was definitely, you know, really quite traumatic. I went from having no reason to not trust in the world around me to suddenly having so much distrust. It was unbelievable. I couldn't look at media outlets because I was like convinced that they were all trying to like brainwash me. There is QAnon. The thing that got me into QAnon was a video by Isaac Cappy, who was an um, actor in Hollywood, who accused a lot of really big celebrities of being a part of a big paedophilia ring. I'm sorry if this is the kind of bursting your bubble, all this information is new. Those accusations by someone who was around these celebrities made it more real in a, in a way. April time was like my worst time because it was sort of like just after lockdown and I wasn't able to sort of like see people. And so it was sort of like a loneliness that I couldn't cure. My um, mother, she um, tried to convince me to go to counselling because there wasn't a lot she could say. She would show me videos or she would like talking about when she was growing up, there were similar theories and it wasn't true. And it did help a little bit. And I think that did help me sort of like transition outwards. I sort of realised things that I believed in was fabricated. And so suddenly it made things feel more like a theory rather than a belief. Hello. Beautiful, beautiful cat. <laughs> so as you see, there's a lot of Trump fans here, of course, as it is a Q meeting. In verschiedenen Ländern der Erde. Kinder aus den Händen. Pädophile Netzwerke befreit. Mora Pedia Nigika, Hiliades on Arthimo. Topia eine Kakopimena Vasanismena, Sta Profira Thanatu. To Catalava, to Catalavena de Afto. What I found is that QAnon International had 1.85 million members, which is approximately a little less than half than the entire QAnon population. Most of these 1.85 million followers have appeared really within the last six months, which kind of shows the impact of the pandemic where, you know, QAnon Italy and QAnon Spain saw massive growth after the lockdowns and after the, the huge impact COVID had on those populations. So I think the internationalization of the movement is something that is being grossly underestimated at the moment. What we're really seeing is a large scale anti-government conspiracy that's gone international. And I think that poses a threat not just to the US election that's coming up in a few days time, but also to democracies around the world and to collective trust in institutions. So it's the thing that I find the most interesting and also the most terrifying. I think that whether we have a Trump win in November or a Trump loss, in November QAnon is going to continue to grow. I am 100% behind Q. He's working for the president, he's working for our country. The narrative, the, the propositional elements of QAnon, there's no reason to think that it would necessarily produce violence or that those who affiliate with it or who are deeply loyal to Donald Trump's presidency would necessarily take up violence. I, I think it's probably more plausible to think that, you know, most people are quite nonviolent. Just that if you follow the logic, if you are fighting an entity that is evil to its core, if you're fighting Nazis, then violence would be justified. Do you tolerate it when the Nazis win an election? I will die for my country and my family and my friends. And they ain't gonna win. There ain't nothing else. They ain't gonna you win. don't want none of this. The liberals ain't gonna win. Nope. The FBI has warned that QAnon could motivate extremists in the U.S. to carry out acts of violence. It's already been linked to several violent acts, including the murder of a mafia boss, as well as two QAnon members that live stream their crimes. One man created a standoff with authorities at the Hoover Dam. No more lies! The other taking his five children and wife on a high-speed chase with police. Donald Trump, I need a miracle or something. Somebody cue in and help me. Gonna help you. Following Twitter's lead, 
Facebook and Instagram announced in October that they would be banning groups, pages, and accounts that represented QAnon. The post-internet age has both connected and unplugged our society, leaving many intellectually curious users isolated and thirsting for answers to the endemic problems of our globalized society. I'm so much more concerned about the population of people who don't believe, but who, who, who can be brought to the state where they don't know what to believe. That's the worry. That's where the action is. Changing the minds of a true believer is perhaps impossible. And that's where I think trying to open up a conversational space where you can just hear each other and get curious about how each other comes to the views they each have. That's where it might be possible to sustain friendship with each other. And I do think we need to relearn the skills of civic friendship so that we can make politics with each other instead of making war.